Uh, you ever hear that phrase, who does he think he is, God's gift to women, or uh, who does he think he is, God's gift to the world? Uh, today's sermon is, you are God's gift to the church. Let's turn to uh, Matthew chapter 19. We're going to look at some of the same stuff we looked at last week. Matthew chapter 19, from 16 to the end of the chapter. If you're having trouble finding Matthew 19, you can find Matthew 18, and then just go to the right. You'll end up in the right place. Matthew chapter 19 from verse 16. Then a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? That's a really important question. That's a key question. How can I get eternal life? How can I uh, live forever? Why do you ask me about what is good? Which is not the way most of us in this room would have answered that question. How can I have eternal life? Why are you asking me about what's good? Jesus replied, there's only one who is good. If you want to enter eternal life, keep the commandments. Well, which ones? That's kind of a natural response, right? Jesus replied, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. All these I've kept. Very confident young fella, the young man said. What do I still lack? Well, we know from the Sermon on the Mount that everybody is spiritually broken, that nobody is the, who they should be. Uh, Jesus defined murder as having hate in your heart. He defined uh, having lust in your heart as committing adultery. Uh, nobody has been completely honest uh, with themselves and with the Lord. Uh, nobody loves completely as they should. Jesus was letting this man know he doesn't measure up, but he didn't get it. He says, hey, I'm all good. Is there anything else I need? Because I want to nail this eternal life stuff. He's not seeing need. He's going forward in confidence in his own flesh. I've done all this, the young man replied. Is there anything else that I need to add? If you want to be perfect, Jesus says, why don't you go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. And that's exactly what he didn't want to hear. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus knew that there was a big barrier between that man's heart and the heart of God. His wealth, his stuff, his things was getting between him and knowing God. Then Jesus said to his disciples, truly I tell you, it's hard for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Dear God, give me a better job and give me a lot more money. Dear God, I just want my kids to have a better life than me. Give them a lot of money. It's hard for a wealthy person to enter the kingdom of heaven. What happens if we get all the wealth in the world and our kids grow up and they don't care about God? What a tragedy that would be. What could be worse? Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. There's some debate whether they're talking about a narrow gate in the wall of Jerusalem that was called the needle and trying to get a camel through there. You can, it, you know, picture a sewing needle, okay? How are you going to get a camel through that? Well, it's going to take a large blender. Uh, it is not going to be easy to get a camel through the eye of a needle. And Jesus says, it's easier to do that than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, because they were so spiritually astute, they were greatly astonished and asked, well, then who can be saved? If the, you see, we always think, wow, he's rich. God's really blessing. If the rich guy can't buy his way into heaven, well, how are we going to, how can anybody get into heaven? Jesus looked at them and said, listen, guys, with human beings, it is impossible. And that was my point that I was making to that guy who thought he had his act all together. He had barriers between himself and, and, and God. With human beings, salvation is impossible. All right. I can tell you something. Some of you are not hearing what I just said. 
With human beings, you cannot earn your salvation. With human effort, salvation is impossible. Well, what if I go to church every week? That was the sound of that X button, you know. I don't know, do Americans do that? Japanese do that, and I did it, and I realized maybe people don't know what they They go, when you're wrong. Uh, with human beings, salvation is impossible. You can't earn your way, no matter how many good things you do. You can't buy your way. You, you can't go to church enough. You can't serve the poor enough. You can, we can never be good enough because heaven is perfect. And brothers and sisters, we ain't. We are far, far, far. We fall short of our own standards for who are the people we would like to be, let alone falling short of God's standard for us. With human beings, it is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. And that's why we fall on our knees before God, say, Lord, forgive. We say, thank you for the cross where Jesus took responsibility for all of my sin. On the cross, my guilt, my shame was poured on him. He took it all. So now I have his righteousness, that's the exchange. I have his goodness, and I stand before God, and, and I know that I'm saved, and I know that I'm going to heaven, not because I'm so good, but because Jesus is so good, and he loved me enough to take responsibility for my sin. Peter answered him because he's still, you know, he's just sharp, he's just brilliant spiritually. He said, Jesus says, listen, it's impossible for human beings. Uh, and Peter said, hey, but wait. We left everything to follow you. What are we going to get out of it? See? Peter is missing it. So Jesus says to the rich young ruler, you have to give up your wealth. Why? Well, what is it that's between you and God? For some people, honestly, in, in, think about at work or, or in the school environment, it's popularity. There's, some, there's a tug in your heart. I, I think God is real. I want to follow after him. But what do my friends think? And Jesus to you would have said, you've got to give up all your friends. For, for other people, it's a lifestyle. For other people, it's a, 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 a comfort zone that they want to be in. And, and my life is comfortable, and if I follow Jesus, it might not be comfortable. And so Jesus was, he looks at each one of us, and he was looking at this young man, and he knew exactly what needed to change in his heart. But Peter, even after explained about how salvation is impossible, he doesn't get it. What happens next, I think, is just gorgeous. But you know what? I way outrun my notes. I'm preaching way ahead of time here. Okay, let's go back. <laughs> yeah, I know. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> the rich young guy just goes away scared. We're going to do some repeating here just so we hit everything. The rich young guy goes away. He's sad. He's disappointed. And you know why? Because he wanted a simple answer to a simple question. What do I have to do to be saved? God, tell me the minimum. That I have, what are the requirements that I have to check in order to be right with you? What do I have, what boxes do I need to fill out? What do I have to do so I can go to heaven? We want simple answers. We want to know the bottom line, the minimal commitment. How can I squeak by and get to heaven? And Jesus made nothing easy. Brothers and sisters, the last time you shared your faith with people, did you try to make it as easy as possible? Did you try to water down the gospel? So You didn't want to talk about sin. You just want to talk about the good things that will happen when you become a Christian. He's going to help your marriage. He's going to put more money in your bank or whatever, you know. I think sometimes we, when we share the gospel, we take away the cross. It's too bloody. When we share the gospel, we don't talk about sin. Jesus made nothing easy on this young guy because he wanted the relationship to be real, this guy starts off complimenting Jesus. He compliments him. Well, what do you want to do in return? You want to say something nice. You're, you're, you're a good Christian. Yeah, you're pretty good yourself. You don't have to repent of anything. <laughs> and Jesus challenges him on the concept of goodness. There is only one good, that's God. Jesus is basically saying, unless I'm God, don't call me good. And by the way, I already see your problem, and don't call yourself good either. This young guy thought he had his life together. Don't call yourself good either. Jesus was trying to make the man think, and it's in the Bible to make us think as well. This passage is uncomfortable. It's not easy. 
and we shouldn't be reading it trying to make it less convicting. If you're trying to do the Holy Spirit dodge, that's a good sign that you're not in step with Jesus. You know, I think God's going to convict me. Whew, got out of that church service just fine, unscathed. If I'm trying to read the Bible to try to make Jesus' words less convicting than they are, that's probably something wrong with the way I'm approaching Scripture. Jesus wanted to make the man think. It's in the Bible because God wants us to think. And we, what do we want? We want a magic prayer. What is that prayer? And if I should sleep before I die or something? Something. If I should die before I wake, I pray thee, Lord, my soul to take. Yeah. Uh, we want a magic prayer. Uh, and that's not a bad prayer for little kids, by the way. But we want a magic prayer that we can just say once. And, oh, I'm saved now. I got, I got myself some hell insurance. So now I don't have to pay attention to God. I don't have to care about God. Jesus decided not to answer the man with the magic prayer. How can I be saved? Well, all you have to do is say the words, I believe in you, Jesus. And that's all. And you, you can walk away and forget about me and you'll be saved. Oh, thank you. I wanted something easy. Because, guess what, brothers and sisters, Jesus is not after you to sign a contract so you can get salvation out of the way and keep your heart far from him. Jesus literally, listen to this, he wants your soul. You mean he wants me? He wants, he wants to take all of me? Yeah. He wants you to love him. He wants you to love being loved by him. Jesus wants everything. He wants everything. And if you were going to marry somebody and they didn't want all of you, wouldn't that be a problem? And if God says he wants me, I'm comforted by the fact that he wants all of me. He wants a total commitment. And I'm comforted by the fact that he's all in as well. Sure, I'll marry you. Can't I just sign a paper somewhere that says we're married and then now I don't have to think about you anymore? And yet, what do we do? Well, I think my child saved. Why? Well, about 20 years ago, they said a magic prayer. Do they care about God today? Well, not really. I'm not saying, by the way, that that prayer wasn't real and that child isn't saved. I'm saying parents, brothers, sisters, just because somebody said some prayer a long time ago and now they're living their life as if they don't care, don't, don't put all your hope on that magic prayer. Do everything you can to bring them back into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Because either they're saved and they're walking out of step, which is just going to bring sorrow into their life, or maybe they never really came to faith at all. That's scary, right? Well, Jesus doesn't give us any simple magic prayer so we can say, it's about relationship. Jesus wants people who will share his vision of the world and have his values and priorities. He wants us to love him. He wants us to love the kingdom. He wants us to love his plans for the world. You know, in some Asian cultures, maybe you've seen this if you went to a, a Chinese restaurant or something, if you go into a home or a business, you might see a shelf in the corner. You ever see that? And on the shelf is, is, is maybe some kind of little religious thing or maybe some flowers or something. It's a kind of altar. And it's usually not so big. They can be big. And sometimes it's there to, like, depending on the culture, maybe to remember your ancestors, or maybe there's a picture of an ancestor there, or, or to, to just respect, this is my family heritage, or, or maybe it's there and it's kind of like there's an, some sort of idolatrous thing there. There's like a, a, a god or a goddess, and it's kind of like a lucky rabbit's foot, right? They, people really don't believe that stuff, but it's like you keep it around for luck. Uh, usually, there's a rel the religious element is downplayed. It's more of a cultural thing to show appreciation for, for, for the heritage. You know what? I think in America, we do that with Jesus a lot. We downplay the religious side of it. It's really kind of a cultural thing. It's a really kind of way to honor my, my parents and my grandparents. I, I'm a Christian. I do the church thing. I'm an American, aren't I? The problem is, the problem is, Jesus loves us way too much for that. He wants to be in a relationship with you. And he's not content for us to put him up on a shelf. Our relationship with God was not designed to be something we could put up there 
in downplay. Jesus is not safe. He says things that make us uncomfortable. He expects a degree of oneness in our relationship that often we're unwilling to give. And, I mean, you've heard the stats. More people, people are on Facebook more than they're in their Bibles. Uh, the Bible is the most owned book in the world and one of the least read. We do everything we can, even people who say they love Jesus, to avoid the Holy Spirit, <laughs> to avoid God's impact on our lives. Now, again, let's look at, again, uh, Matthew 16 through 17. Someone came to him, Jesus uh, said, Teacher, what good thing shall I do that I must uh, be able to attain eternal life? And he said to them, Why are you asking me about what is good? There is only one who is good. But if you wish to enter eternal life, keep the commandments. Now, how does this compare? I want us to read two sections over in Acts. So keep your finger in Matthew. This is, uh, this is like dual wielding, okay? You're going you're gonna to hold on to Matthew, and you're going to turn to the book of Acts. So turn to Acts. Acts chapter 2. What chapter did he say? Don't ask me again. Acts, <laughs> Acts chapter 2, 37 through 41. Uh, let's start at 36. Uh, Peter, Peter is uh, speaking here. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. <clears throat> so there's a good sign. They were cut to the heart. They were convicted. And Peter said to the other apostles, brothers, uh, uh, it cut to, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? So this is like the rich young ruler came. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promises for you and for your children, for all those who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them, and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation, which apparently he wasn't a determinist. <laughs> save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized. About 3,000 were added to their number that day. Now I want you to turn over to Acts 16. Acts 16, and then uh, look down to verse 25. Paul, the Apostle Paul, and his uh, buddy Silas, they're in jail. And they're in jail unjustly. Now, usually people in jail pout about being in jail. Paul did nothing wrong, and he's in jail, and he and his buddy, they're singing and they're praying. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them, and I wonder what they were thinking. What is wrong with these guys? But they're, they're there in prison, and, and they're singing and praying, and the other prisoners, they're paying attention. Suddenly, there was a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. There was su suddenly such a violent earthquake that the very foundations of prison were shaken. At once, the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped, and if they had, his life would have been forfeited. But Paul shouted, Don't harm yourself. We're all here. The jailer called for lights rushed and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the name of the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. When they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the people in the house, at that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and his household were baptized. The jailer brought them out into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his household. So what is it? How do we get eternal life? Believe? Get baptized? Need to give all our stuff away? Well, the answer is we have to believe in Jesus. Being baptized is one of the ways we show obedience to God's will. We have to trust him. And Jesus is telling us what belief in him looks like. And that rich young man was going to put his faith in his stuff, in his position, his own goodness. And he needed to, to uh, get that barrier out of his life. First, what faith in Jesus doesn't look like is a business contract. 
It's not just something you sign and you walk away from and you forget. Jesus wants to be involved intimately in every aspect of our lives. Did you hear that? Jesus wants to be in every aspect of our lives. How we treat one another, the words we use when we talk to one another, the way we raise our children, the way we love our church, the way we talk to people that don't know Jesus yet. Jesus Christ is involved in every aspect. Okay, back uh, in Matthew, we're going to look at 19, uh, 23 through 26. The point here, the point here is that people can't save themselves, but with God anything is, impossible, anything is possible. Anyone can be saved through Jesus Christ. That's 19, 23 through 26. Uh, Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and said, Well, who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With human beings, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And then look down at 27 through 30. Peter answered him, We have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, and this is what gets me, he's not harsh with Peter. Peter didn't get it. And Peter said, well, what am I going to get out of it? I sh- I've, we've given up, we've endured hardship, we gave up this and this and this and this and this for Jesus. What are we going to get out of it? And Jesus didn't look at him and say, wait, weren't you just paying attention to everything I just said? You can't earn your way into heaven. You can't get anything good. With God. It's uh, impossible with human beings. But instead, Jesus looked at him, and I think he was probably smiling or, or just showing warmth and love to his disciples there. And he said, truly, I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man, that's he talked about himself, sits on his glorious throne in heaven, you who have followed me will sit on the 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And then he expands it to beyond the, just the disciples. Listen, do you love Jesus? Are you a follower of Jesus Christ? These words are for you. Listen. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters uh, or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake, everyone who has left these things for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and many who are last will be first. There's two things that I want to focus on here, and one more than the other. First, put yourself in uh, Christ's position here. He had a ministry that was small and struggling. Uh, He had his 12 grown men following him around all the time. The Bible says there was other people, including women, that were often in that group following him around. There were a number of people, and he was traveling from place to place. They lived off of donations. They lived off of donations. He has... Got 12 apostles to feed. That's not going to be easy. He could have answered the rich young man in a way. Listen, he could have answered him. The guy comes to him, what do I need to do? He could have answered him in a way that would have solved his ministry problems financially forever. And he could have said it in such a way that the young man would have felt good about giving to the poor. And he would have like, look at me. I'm giving money to the poor. I'm supporting Jesus. And he would have been blind to the fact that he's not really trusting God. He's trusting his own goodness. Jesus loved him too much to take his money when he wanted his heart. Amen? That money was a barrier between him. And Jesus could have made him feel good about using it and giving it to the ministry and never, ever, ever saw that 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 money was a stumbling block for him. So he could feel religious about himself. And Jesus could have guaranteed all the support he would have ever needed. And he didn't do that. Again, he wasn't after his wallet. He was after his heart. The second thing that really strikes me, and I want to spend a little more time dwelling on this, this is really, really neat. I've read this passage so many times it never hit me this way before. I've, I've read this passage, brothers and sisters, to people who are afraid their family will leave them or reject them if they put their faith in Jesus Christ. And I've been with people who put their faith in Jesus Christ and then they were rejected by their family. 
And I've been with others who were worried their family would reject them, and their family was uncomfortable with it, unhappy about it, but they didn't reject them. This is a reality. If you follow Jesus, your mom and dad might not like it. Your wife might not like it. What are you going to church for all the time? Why are you giving money to church? Your husband might not like it. What about me? You're leaving me every Sunday morning. You're leaving me for Bible study. What about me? Your kids might not like it. What are you so religious for? None of my friends' parents are religious. If you follow Jesus, people may reject you. People may leave you. And that's difficult. That's hard. Everyone who has left houses, you follow me, you might not get that promotion. Just sign here, buddy. We love what you're doing. You're awesome to the business. Uh, we're going to guarantee you at least $10,000 more a year, but you're going to have to come in Sundays. Jesus says, if you leave behind houses, lands, farms, business, family, husband, wife, brothers, sisters, family, for my sake, you will receive many times as much. And you're going to, by the way, as an added bonus, you're going to get eternal life tossed in there as well. Think about Je Jesus is saying. Think about that. And, I, and I've, I've, I've shared this with people who are afraid of this and struggling with this, but I never saw it from this perspective before. If you are following him, ask yourself, am I following Jesus Christ? Do I want to be a Christian? Have I confessed my sins? Am I forgiven? Have I embraced the cross? Do I, do I want to live my life for Jesus Christ? If you're following him, even if you end up losing your job, your house, and your family for his sake, you get heaven. You get eternal life. You get paradise. And by the way, Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve were made for the garden. They were made for paradise. That's a big deal. I bet most of you already knew that, right? You, got, you knew that deal. Yeah. Follow Jesus, I get eternal life. That's actually one of the reasons we're here today, because we believe that. That's not the only blessing you get when you set aside worldly things to obey God, something really jumped out at me more forcefully than it ever has here before in Christ's words. God is saying in no uncertain terms that fellow believers, fellow believers, including those that are seated, seated around you today, they are the reward for your faith. If you have to leave and you have to lose all sorts of relationships for me, you're going to get a lot more. See, Jesus is talking about two rewards. One in the future, that's heaven. But he's talking about right here, right now, you're going to get a lot more than you give up. You're going to get a new family. The people around you are the reward of your faith. And guess what? You are their reward. So show up. Participate. Be a part of what God is doing. Faith in Christ may cost your family. Jesus said, if you love your family more than me, you are not worthy of me. That's, that's Jesus being Jesus. That's Jesus saying, I don't want any other suitors in your life. Come to me. God is saying, I'll multiply many times what you've lost, a new family, an eternal family. Everybody, everybody who loves Jesus, we are going to be in heaven together forever. So you might as well get along now. What is the point of bitterness and division and holding on to grudges and hating one another? What is the point? Because you're going to be stuck with the other Christians for eternity anyways. Love them now. Amen? Amen. Love them now. Forgive again and again and again. Do you ever think that maybe this talk about the church being family is overdone. You want to hear something weird? Sometimes I feel like it's overdone. I think I'm wrong. I think I'm wrong about that because I don't think I've ever heard anybody say it to the extent that Jesus forcefully says it right here. Jesus says, if you're going to lose your parents over me, if you're going to lose your kids over me, 
I'm going to give you a bigger family. I'm going to multiply that many times. You have faith in me, I'm going to give you a reward for your faith. You're going to get a lot of brothers and sisters. Spiritual children, spiritual parents. Look around you. Seriously, just look around you right now. Go ahead. Look around. You love Jesus Christ, these people are the reward of your faith. The Bible says weep together. The Bible says rejoice together. The Bible says that nobody is part of the family by accident. We all bring different gifts and abilities. We all bring different things to the church to build up the body. The Bible talks about the church as a family. It talks about the church as the bride of Jesus, the body of Jesus, as a building, all interconnected, all intimate. You aren't here just for yourself today because you're their reward too and they need you to be here. You are born by human will. You are married into a family by human will, but we are brought into eternal family by the blood of Jesus and this is God's great plan, not just to save us from our sin, not just to save us from death, but to save us to a new life and a new family. And Jesus is serious about the new family. And all through the New Testament, we hear about unity and oneness and community and togetherness. Through the entire New Testament, pay attention, there's a bunch of verses that say one another, one another, one another. It's not an accident. Jesus is talking about the one anotherness of, of the community of faith, of, Christi of Christians, fellow Christians living together. I want to close with a thought that Yumi and I heard at the Pastors and Wives Conference we went to last week, which was phenomenal. Uh, God has designed us for relationship. We need it. We need other believers. We're not called to be Lone Ranger Christians. We need to be in a relationship with God, and we need to be with one another in the church. We need fellowship. We need to know that we matter to others. Oh, wait a second. That's emotional neediness. That's not right. Follow me, okay? We need to know that we matter to others. We need respect. Oh, I don't... I, yeah, you were made that way. Love. We need to be loved. We need to be acknowledged. We need to be appreciated. We need to be encouraged. The comment was made a couple times at the conference, ain't no one on the planet is too encouraged. Does that speak to you? Did that just preach to you? Have you ever worried like, oh, I don't want to compliment her too much, she's going to get full of herself. Or no, 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 no. I, if I compliment that person too much, they're going to get arrogant. Show that to me in the Bible. <laughs> Let the Holy Spirit be the Holy Spirit for that person. Go encourage them. Nobody is to encourage. Satan, the Bible says Satan is the God of this world. He wants to grind humanity into the ground. He wants to say, you're just an animal. There is no spark of divinity in you. You're just dust. You're here. You're gone. That's it. It's a, it's a, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. It's a world where you use people to get ahead. It's a world full of tears. It's a world full of death. It's a dead-end world. This world is not an encouraging place to be. Everyone in this room needs to be encouraged. There's nobody in this room who is too encouraged. People need to feel security. People need to believe they're approved of. They don't want to walk into a circle of people and think, oh, who does he think he is? Who does she think he is? What's wrong with this person? Junior high school kids are really good at looking at you like, what's wrong with you? What's up with you? As you know what? They're in junior high. They're immature. As adults, let your face show that you're happy to see the other people. You come to Bible study, let people know you're happy they're there. You come to church, let people know you're happy they're there. We don't need to be junior high school kids. Yeah. <laughs> any junior high school kids over there, God loves you. Uh, but don't stay at that level of maturity. If people are always feeling unapproved of, 
or, or that we're critical of them, they're not walking in blessing. God created us with emotional needs. You know, uh, there's a difference between having needs and being needy. God designed us with needs. We need to eat, otherwise we're going to starve. We need to drink or we're going to die of thirst. We need to have clothes or we're going to freeze to death. God creates us also with emotional needs, and these needs are intended to be met in our spiritual Christian family. So we have physical needs, but what happens when you eat? Too, well, let's not get too personal. Uh, what happens if you eat too much? I mean, our eating can be out of whack. There's all sorts of eating disorders. Things can be out of balance. And our emotional needs can get out of whack as well. And if we're always in a place where we demand, I demand that you meet my emotional needs, that's not good. And that's a difficult line. To be able to tell somebody, listen, I feel unappreciated because you always forget my name. And you're not saying it in a demanding, a critical way, but you're saying, here's how you can love me. Try and remember my name. Here's how you can love me. Can you remember our anniversary? Here's, here's how you can love me. You know, that's okay to share those things as long as you're not demanding and as long as you're not going to hold a grudge if the other person struggles with it. If we become bitter because others don't love us enough, guess what? That's wrong. You were not brought to the church so you could feel bitter that you're not getting enough attention, respect, or love. There's the old adage, if you want to have friends, be a friend. It's true in the church, too. Go out there and love others. Go out there and res show respect to others. Show confirmation. Affirm them. If we're always an emotional sponge and we're always needing others to pour into us all the time, we rarely go out of our way to bless them. We are out of balance. There's a difference between having needs, which are legitimate, and always being needy. So we're always a receptacle of blessing, but we can't bless other people. God himself, listen, God himself has needs. God himself needs to be loved and to be honored and respected. He needs to be in a relationship. He needs to communicate. He needs to be wanted. He needs to be appreciated. But guess what? God is not needy. Because all of these things are already met in the Trinity. And that's why the Trinity is not an incidental element of Christianity. It's not just, oh yeah, and there's three. The Trinity is at the heart of Christianity because if God wasn't in community, God Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, guess what? Then you'd have a God who's loving, but there's no object of love. That means he needs somebody. He needs you so that he can love. God doesn't need us because he's already got a community of, of love. And in the, in the Trinity, God affirms the Son. This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. Did you see that? And Jesus saying, I don't do anything unless the Father says it. Respect, love, affirmation, respect, all these elements in the Trinity. It's not wrong to need these things because you are made in the image of God. You are made, I need to be affirmed here. Does anybody really care? Need some respect here. Need some love. That's not bad things. You were made with those things. Remember God, when he's talking in the Old Testament, he says, someday, we talked about God someday, my people are going are gonna to look up and call me God. I will be their God and they will be my children. God's yearning for this someday when the relationship is made right. In the church, let's really work hard. Not at saying, uh-oh, my emotional needs aren't being met. No, we're not going to do that. That's, that's a dead end. Let's really work hard at affirming one another. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. I love it that you're here. Building each other up, encouraging one another, lifting each other. And it's not our job to keep track on them to make sure they don't get out of line. It's not our job to be looking down at people all the time. God himself has these needs, and we have them too because we're made in his image. God created us in his image. We were made to join him in relationship with him and with other Christians, beginning in our local church, and people around you are the reward of your faith. And in a good sense, in a good sense, guess what? You are God's gift to this church. You are God's gift to one another, the reward of their faith. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are a relational God.
You made us, Father, with these needs. We're not, we're, we don't, we're not all on our own, God. We weren't meant to be loners. God, you, you made us for community. You made us for family, just like you have family in the Trinity. Lord God, help us to be aware of this. Help us, Father, to, to, to seek to encourage and affirm and lift up, to show respect, to, show, to, to pour love on one another, Lord. Father, I pray that this family that we've been called to, this reward of our faith, that if we have to give up things in this life, that the exchange that we get, what we get in return is so much greater than what we give up, Lord. Help us to work actively at being a blessing to others who have put their faith in you. Lord God, thank you that we could be at church today. Please build our church. Please, please, Lord, give us opportunities to share our faith with our community. Please help us to, to welcome more people into this family that you're building here, Lord. Help us to love you more than anything and to love others the way you love them, Lord God. Let us be people of love and people of grace. One family in Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you for watching Foundation TV. Foundation TV is a ministry of Foundation Bible Church, Janesville, Wisconsin. Find us online at foundationbiblechurch.com. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.